Okay. Okay, well, hello to everybody who's joined us. It's great to see so many people online for a Saturday IETFL webinar. Um, as Mercedes Viola couldn't be with us today, I'll be moderating uh, Fiona Dunlop's webinar on behalf of IETFL. And I'm very happy to be doing so because it looks like it's going to be a fantastic session on professional development. Um, a massive thanks to Fiona uh, for doing the uh, webinar and Mercedes for helping with the preparation. Um, I'd also like to just say a big thank you to Rob Tabo um, from the IATFL BSIG online team who has kindly agreed to help um, out instead of watching um, his beloved Springboks play against the Welsh national rugby team. Um, so thanks, Rob. Just a little bit of background on Fiona for those of you who don't know her. Um, Fiona is the academic director at Wimbledon School of English in London. And over the last 25 years, she has been involved in an impressive array of ELT spheres, including teacher training, business English, academic management, um, and other things. Uh, she currently gives talks and provides training on many aspects of ELT, such as continuing professional development, course design, training new teachers, teacher observation, academic quality, and motivating long-stay students. Uh, today, Fiona is going to be talking about how to access continuing professional development as a busy professional, um, including giving us tips on how to find what is relevant and useful and how to stay structured and focused while keeping individual goals in mind. Um, I'm very much looking forward to it, so without any further ado, I'll hand over to you, Fiona. Lovely. Thanks, Pete. And um, hi, everyone. It's fabulous to see you all um, on a Saturday afternoon as well, so um, thank you all for joining me. Um, now, just to start, what I'll tell you that I would like to, I'll tell you a little about myself. I know that Pete's already mentioned, but um, I started teaching in 1989, which does seem like quite a long time ago for me now. And um, I started teaching, I was so passionate, and I've never lost that passion for teaching. And um, way back in 1989, there weren't even very many things that we can access, such as photocopies on a regular basis. So it really was about developing on our feet a lot of the time. And um, I, I became so passionate for learning and developing in my career. So hopefully I can share a little of that with you all today and give you some ideas on, on, on things that I've done to and, and still do to, to professionally develop. So what I hope to cover today just move to my aims are um, the, the following things. So hopefully I'll outline, outline reflective tools to demonstrate how much we do develop already and try and recognize what we do achieve and what we do learn on a daily basis. I'd like to consider the, the importance of goal setting and breaking goals down. Um, identify a variety of CPD opportunities that are accessible to us. Now a lot of these you'll probably be familiar with, so there may be reminders and it's maybe about thinking how might you adapt these to suit your needs and your situations in whatever uh, language environment you're in. Uh, I'm going to look at a CPD framework and consider how this can help us guide our CPD choices and give us a little bit of structure. And finally, provide pointers in implementing CPD into our working lives as busy professionals, which um, I'm sure we all are. And so once again, 35 people online on a Saturday afternoon. And um, we're obviously all very passionate about this subject. So first of all, to move on, what is CPD? One definition that Keith Harding gave uh, a few years ago in the uh, modern English language teacher was the following that you can see on your screens here. Just give you a second to read that there. So Keith suggests that continuous professionals should always be looking for ways to deal with new challenges and improve performance. It's the responsibility of the individual teacher. For us to own it, I think, is what he means here, um, who identifies her own needs and how to meet those needs. Evaluative rather than descriptive, so that the teacher understands the impact of the activity. And the one that I find most relevant is that it's an essential component of professional life, not an extra. And that's something that I think very often in our busy lives, it's easy for us to say, I'm too busy to do 
NACPD activity. And it's, for me, it's about trying to integrate it into what we already do and recognise that we are learning and developing all the time. So why, I guess, why do we want to pursue professional development as teachers? And I'm sure you've all got your own ideas as well. But um, to outline some of mine, interest and motivation, of course, um, keeps us stimulated. What, what is the point of spending so much of our lives doing our work if, if we're not interested, if we're not motivated? To stay current, I think it's very important. And we owe this to ourselves as well as to the students in our organisations that we work for. To know what's going on in the, the industry, in the profession, and, and decide which of the, the, the new trends are actually relevant to us. I know at the moment people are talking about demand high, Adrian Underhill and Jim Scrivener. Um, do we know about these? Are we interested? Are they relevant to us? So staying current. It gives us a feel-good factor. And I must say, um, webinars for me are, are fairly new, and so I, I was saying to a friend this morning, why am I making myself do something that makes me so nervous, and it's because of the feel-good factor of being able to share some of my experiences and the whole new environment of, of working online for me like this as well. We owe it to our students. You know, it's, it's so key, isn't it? You know, again, why are we doing this if not to to move our students on and to allow them to reach their goals? Possible employment prospects and career advancement. And I think more and more organisations, certainly in the UK, but I, I think in many countries, it's, it's becoming part of the recruitment process. And it's about us as teachers recognising our strengths, recognising the direction that we're putting ourselves in, in terms of our profession, and, and promoting that to, to organisations in order to, to grow in our employment prospects. And with that, hopefully, um, wishful thinking possibly, you might say, but um, possible further financial gain. And finally, for me, why pursue CPD? The, the big one is it enhances the reputation of our profession, which in turn is so cyclical. I mean, if, if we are enhancing the reputation of our profession to the outside world, we're going to be taken more seriously. We're going to be recognised internationally across all different industries, for example, governments recognising the, the value of what we do, this will lead again to better recognition and, and also hopefully better terms and conditions at the end of the day. So these are some of the reasons that I feel that it's important to, to not let our CPD slip and to integrate it into our lives. There's a wonderful new publication by British Council, which is um, a, a number of case studies from across the world, uh, including, I believe, India, Estonia, various countries. Amazing, amazing publication. But one of the quotes that's come out of this is that CPD enriches teachers' professional lives, which in turn contributes to student learning and overall improvement in the quality of school systems. It kind of sums up the reasons why I feel that CPD is certainly important to me and, and to the team that I now work with as well. So, I think it's important then to think before we look forward, to be holistic and to think what have we achieved, what have we learned, and then how do we take this forward. I think these two areas need to be connected. And so even in my personal life, and hopefully a lot of you out there will do this as well, possibly about twice a year, I take the time to think, what have I achieved personally and professionally? And again, that feel-good factor of knowing that I have done something and where does that take me from now, I think is all important. And being aware of our achievements allows us to structure our CB CBD pathway in a realistic and meaningful way. And who said that? Well, that's me. <laughs> that's, that's my belief, certainly. Um, that if, if we do know what we've achieved and, and break those achievements down the same that we do goals, it will allow us to structure a more realistic pathway for ourselves. I've got here a little task. This is something. Uh, I don't want you falling off your chairs as you read the first line of this. Uh, 
is to look at your achievement. And I'm going to ask you all, if you take nothing more from the next 50 minutes with me, take this task home and try this over the next week. Next week, next two weeks. I did it about 15 years ago, and you know, I, I would say that it really changed the, the direction of my professional life. So the task is, over the next week, over the next two weeks, think of 250 achievements you've had in your life. And it sounds like, I'm sure you're all thinking, absolutely not. I could not do that. 250 is far too much. What this does is you, you find that you build up a picture of, of what you've done in your life and what an achievement is. An achievement isn't only the big things, but it's every little thing that we do every day as teachers, as professionals. Um, trying a new activity, using a new course book successfully, dealing with a new student and integrating them into the class, those can all be recognized as your achievements. Um, and they all give you that same feel-good factor. So it's about recognizing these. And then look back and think, how has this made you feel? And it really does make you feel that you can achieve the world. Uh, so then from there, you take this forward. Set 20 more. Share this experience with your colleagues. Let them know what you've done. Present it to them in a teacher's meeting. And, and get other people involved in this kind of thing. Now, just to give you an example, I, I learned to drive last year. I passed my driving test. And this, for me, was an amazing achievement um, at, at an older age than, than most in learning to drive. But other achievements for me were actually getting myself to my driving lesson every Saturday morning when there were much more interesting things to do. Every single Saturday, that was an achievement as well. So I do believe it's about recognizing your achievements in order to plan and move forward. So moving on. Moving on to planning and going forward. As we break down our achievements, it's just as important to break down our goals to have goals, to have smart goals, and, and to, to believe in them. Don't, don't make them someone else's goals. I'm not sure how many of you work in an organization um, where possibly your line managers will, will help you set goals, but the goals must come from you. And I talk here about smarter goals. So if I just put this up, so there we are. So smarter goals, and I'm sure you've all heard of smart goals. And I'm just going to go through these for you, but a SMART goal should be specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-bound. These are the ones that we know. However, I think it's also extremely important that these goals are enjoyable. You must feel that you're getting something out of, of the goal that you're trying to achieve. And of course, we must reflect. So there must be an element of reflection in there as well. Looking back, how successful was this? How successful was it for me? Was it useful? Was it useful to my students? An achievement here, I've just seen Elena. I will come back to some questions later on. But Elena from Moscow. Hi, Elena. She just asked, could I clarify what is meant by an achievement? In doing the task of trying to to identify 250 achievements that you've had, you might start with, I mean, you might decide to focus only on the, the professional. Uh, so getting a new job, getting a promotion, uh, getting your students through the exam that you've been working with them on. Those could be achievements. But hopefully what you will find is as you identify those big achievements, things that you have accomplished in your professional life, that you will see that each of those achievements came with a number of smaller achievements. And you couldn't have achieved the, the top one without, without working on all of the other little bites in between. I hope that makes sense, Elena. So a smarter goal, to give you, to give you an example here. Um, here's a personal one, personal one that I might save till next year, uh, I think, in January. Uh, but I'm going to lose five kilos in the next two months, let's say, by cycling to the park twice a week. So that's not wishy-washy. We all make goals to say, especially in the new year here in this country, uh, we'll, we'll set new year resolutions where we might say, 
I'm going to lose weight, I'm going to, I'm going to start going to the gym. But these are very wishy-washy. And as a result, gym memberships go down the drain, don't they? We all have the best intentions and we don't go. So here I've made a smarter go. It's certainly enjoyable because I love cycling. Uh, but I'm going to lose five kilos. It's going to be in the next two months. So it's very specific. It's measurable, the five kilos. It's achievable. That's not a difficult thing. It, so it's realistic. And it's time bound in the next two weeks. And then I'll look back and decide where I go from there. That's an example of a smarter goal. So while you're working on, you, <laughs> you're going to go away from this thinking, where am I going to find the time for these two tasks? While you're working on your 250 tasks, I also suggest that this evening, when or whatever time it is in your countries, um, log off and start thinking about some real goals that you want to set. Make them professional or make them personal goals. I find the two are very interrelated for me. Um, but set two smarter goals. Try and do this this evening. And tell somebody. If you tell somebody, there's more chance that you don't want to lose face. You are going to work on those goals. So I'm just, I'm just giving you a chance to kind of take that in. Um, before I move on now, and I'd like to think, so how do we fit all of this in? How do we fit looking at our achievements, setting our goals, achieving our goals, integrating it into our busy lives? How do we do that? Well, I'd like to share with you now a reflective tool that I've used several times, either myself or with colleagues. And this reflective tool, it comes from an idea called systems thinking. It's a systems thinking task. And systems thinking is where you look at the whole system. Could be the whole system of your life or your organization. And what are the main components of this system? And what energies go into the system and what energies come back from the system? We then look at how changing some of these amounts of energy would have a knock-on effect on other areas. Now, let me just give you an example of this. So this is my system thinking map here. Now, I'm, as, um, as you know, I'm the academic director of a school, so I manage a staff of about 20 to 25 teachers now. And one of my main areas is to work on everyone's CPD. Uh, my teachers at Wimbledon School of English are very experienced, so their CPD, as, as well as mine, must be very relevant, challenging, and well-pitched. So my work is, is a wonderful job. I love my work, and these are the areas I see as coming into my job. So the teachers I work with, the students, the administration, long-term projects I have, and my own development. Now, if we think, first of all, about the teachers that I work with, so what do I give to them? What energy do they get from me? Well, they get my energy. They get my time. I'm there for them. I provide guidance. I observe them. I set goals with them. We work together. Uh, we share a lot of CPD experiences. Uh, they have my patience. I will always make time. We have an open-door policy at school. They have my empathy. I'm there at their beck and call when they need me. And then I give them more time. So that's what I give to the teachers. What do I get back from that? Well, that for me is one of the most satisfying parts of my job. And I certainly get a sense of achievement, a sense of reward when I see teachers growing in themselves and, and enjoying their profession the way I do. It gives me job satisfaction. And there's also, of course, the social aspect. We're all teachers. It's a sociable job, isn't it? We couldn't do it if we didn't like working with people. Uh, so those are the two lines of, of movement of energy that I see there. Now, just to give you an example, if I were to move some, or if I were to move some of the time away from the teachers and into the administration, what might happen? And this is where we play about with this map. 
if you if you create this map, it's an ongoing job, it's an ongoing task, which allows you to see where you can start to manipulate how you do things in your daily lives. And um, so, for example, if I move time away from my teachers into administration, well, that, in all honesty, could have a negative effect because the teachers may not do their jobs as well or as happily, as, as successfully and in as fulfilling a way as if they had more of my time. So it could actually end up adding to my administration. So that's not a good idea. So it's about, it's about analyzing this map, building it up, and making you yourself aware of where you're putting your time and if, there's, if there are other ways of working and seeing where you can fit in your CPD and where CPD already exists within your working lives. Again, what I would suggest with this kind of map is that you have it ongoing. I have the first one I did was possibly 16 years ago. It was before I started my current job. And um, I still have this. And I bring that first map out from time to time just to see how my life has changed, how my life has developed, and is certainly my, my working life. And I do a new map at least once or twice a year. And it's a, it's a very useful sharing tool as well. If you share this with your colleagues, and you, you get a better idea of, of the time and how you're managing it and how you can work on your own CPD. So I would suggest you try this. What I would say to you is it's a very powerful tool. Uh, do be prepared. You really are. It's a very reflective tool. You're doing a lot of self-analysis. Do pe be prepared to find uh, surprises in there. Uh, but I, I do recommend you try this. So I would like to move on. What I've thought about so far is how we reflect, recognizing our achievements by doing that, and then moving on to setting our goals. And this is wonderful. But what I'm talking about, the, the theme is how do we access CPD? And my background, nowadays I find CPD is very accessible. And sometimes it's about channel, channeling it and structuring it. But in the past, Certainly, I found myself in quite remote situations, working as a freelancer, working in small towns, and possibly without internet access, um, feeling quite isolated sometimes. And I had to seek out what was there, because automatically, what comes to our minds with CPD is, is it's maybe about reading or attending workshops, attending conferences. But I believe there's a lot more. And I'm just going to share some of my ideas with you. And I, I know this is quite a small slide. But I'm going to bring, I'm going to just let you have a little look at that, and then I'm going to pull out some of these. So, what's available, what's accessible to us? Well, of course, IATEFL. <laughs> and all the SIG, BSIG conference a couple of weeks ago, everything that comes with IATEFL. And again, it is much more than the conference as well. There is so much out there. And there are so many networks that come out of IATEFL as well. And it's about tapping into that and not being shy to do that. Local CPD groups, in-house CPD sessions. These things most organizations do. And I know that some of you will be saying, well, I'm a freelancer. I'm not connected to a school. That's where you can look at local CPD groups and start one up. Why not? It only takes two people to be a group. Uh, so start a discussion group, choose some topics, share some ideas, turn it into a kind of book club idea, make it a social event, get people from other, other walks of life in education as well. It doesn't need to be only ELT that you, you're, you're talking about. It can be other areas of education. Peer observation, of course. And with peer observation, I would say a lot of schools certainly have a peer observation system, but it's maybe not always implemented. And I do think it's, we in our school, a couple of years ago, we revisited our peer observation system with all of the teaching staff. And we reinvented it and we re-enthused about it. And that's one of the most popular things that we do in school. 
if you feel that this is the case in your school, then I would say bring this to the teacher's attention, bring it to your manager's attention, get it up and running again. Very often, peer observation, the problem is time. Um, and, and I have no great solution to that. It can be about covering a class, it can be about moving a class around. But peer observation is invaluable. And I do a lot of observation now as the academic manager. And I am so appreciative every time I step into someone's class. You learn something every time you do that. Now, with peer observation, there doesn't need to be any criticism at all. And this is something that came out of, I'm just reading here, uh, Cherry from India has just said that it's, it, it can be that teachers are sensitive to criticism. With peer observation, it should be a sharing exercise. If you're going to, to visit your colleague, have a checklist of things that you want to look at, that you want to work on, rather than doing a crit for the teacher. It would be my advice. Um, pop in observations by an invited guest. And this really is where two, two different possibilities with this, with pop-in observations. The first one is, is for you to try to organize, to pop in, to see a variety of different teachers for 10 minutes at a time. And in doing that, you get a feel for a variety of styles without it being threatening to the teacher that you're coming in to see. And again, you can learn a lot in 10 minutes. But the other thing to do as a teacher is if we identify areas that we want to work on or we want to develop in, invite somebody in and give them the boundaries so that this is a non-threatening environment. It's a learning, it's a developing environment. You can invite your manager or a colleague or sometimes just inviting a friend or a family member in will make you teach in a different way. It will make you more reflective in your teaching. Self-observation as well. Uh, Self-observation, again, is something that we talk about now and again, but it's about actually implementing it. And it's important here for this to work, for you to be quite self-motivated or to work with a friend, with a partner, with a colleague. Now, self-observation, you decide that, for example, I'll talk you through a process. So, for example, next Wednesday, you want to do an observed lesson, but it's a self-observed lesson. And you want to work on, let's say, process writing skills. So what you do is you do a full lesson plan as if someone were coming to observe you. If you're sharing this experience with a partner, with a colleague, or with your line manager, make a point of having a meeting beforehand to talk through your observation lesson plan. Then go into your class, run your, your observed lesson, come back out and make a time either by yourself or with a colleague or your line manager to talk through what you did, what you're happy with. And again, this is an amazing experience for self-reflection here. What we often find is that we are more critical of ourselves and by doing this in such a structured way, this type of self-observation, we actually do start to recognize that we did a lot of things well. And it allows us to develop in different areas without the need for a lot of time. People will say to me, CPD, I've got no time for CPD. We've got no money in our school for CPD. Well, things that self-observation just take a little bit of dedication. They don't need to take up too much more of your time. Reflection in general, I'm mentioning this a lot, keeping a lesson journal. Keeping a lesson journal, again, don't make it a big thing. Break it down. Make it that you write five minutes. Five minutes is quite a long time to write. I don't know if you've ever emailed yourself a reminder to do something. It takes a minute, doesn't it? So five minutes. Email yourself. Keep a reflective email journal, handwritten. Just not, note down after every day what you've enjoyed, what you've learned, where you feel you could develop more. And keep and read it back. Read it back once a week, once every two weeks. Online support, of course. Idea sharing groups in school and online. A mentor and a buddy system. Again, this is something that we can start 
on our own, no matter how much or how little support you have from an organisation. Hook up with someone. This can be someone now, there, there are 44 people in the audience at the moment. Why not share experiences and share a, a mentor system amongst some of the people here? Get email addresses, keep in touch. It doesn't need to be that it's a face-to-face -face contact. You can email lesson plans, you can email uh, ideas, you can video yourself now, and you can work on specialist areas. It might be that you both want to work on the same area together to develop, or it might be that you decide to hook up with someone. If, if you know that your friend is extremely dynamic and you're quite structured, then work together in different styles. Experimental day once a week. This is so easy, but as, as a busy teacher, this takes it, that's a bit like getting up and going to the gym. It's so easy to think, oh, no, I'm not going to. Do it. Try one different thing once a week. And, and look back and again reflect and see how it's made you feel and how it's made the students feel. But then moving on, we can also think that CPD isn't, it's about what's going on in the classroom, the ideas that have been shared in the staff room, the going to workshops, the having discussion groups, going to conferences, being online. But it's also about what you do within ELT, within your job, in terms of possibly course design, different project work. We can put ourselves forward for things like this. Even if it's not coming at us, if it's not being offered to us, put ourselves forward to do project work within an organization. Or again, by ourselves, materials writing. We all do that anyway as teachers. Um, but give it a name, give it a title, give it recognition as your CPD. Timetable opportunities. Uh, requesting, putting yourself forward for different courses. Courses that are maybe out of your comfort zone as well. Take them. The, the, this is one of my biggest, I don't, even, I don't want to call it a fault, but I tend to say yes to anything that um, is, is offered to me in a work environment. And I've learned so much from it. But, um, Yes, you can end up, maybe that's not something that I want to, to suggest. Don't say yes to everything at work. <laughs> but certainly put yourself forward for things out of your comfort zone. Uh, shared board, corner for ideas in the staff room. Simple reading, taking time just to read what's out there and delving into other parts of education again and seeing what's going on in other areas, in universities, in ELT schools, in further education, in secondary schools. Writing articles. I know that many, many organizations, and many publications are keen to hear from teachers from all over the world. Put your name to your thoughts, even if it's about something that you've taken away from this hour that we're spending together. Write an article based on a systems thinking task you've done or a reflection on your own CPD in the last year. Other teachers are interested to read that, and it's a good way of focusing what you're achieving and where you're going forward. Action research projects, I'm going, I'm going to talk about them in a little more detail in a minute. Um, presenting at conferences, again, might move you out of your comfort zone sometimes, but really the feel-good factor that you get afterwards is amazing. Job shadowing, if you can do that. And I know that uh, some organizations, some countries, some governments provide funding for job shadowing. And I've actually got someone from Spain, an academic manager coming from Spain to, to job shadow with me for a week in February. And I'm thoroughly looking forward to that, to sharing experiences. It, a week is a long time. Uh, you might not want to do that, but just job shadowing with someone from another school for a day or something as well. But of course, that can be difficult. I can see Pete saying that can be difficult. And yes, it is. And then moving into positions of responsibility. Uh, and, and again, putting yourself forward and considering things that maybe you hadn't considered before or joining things together. Building up your CPD profile so that you have something that would move you automatically into a position of responsibility. And I know that a lot of teachers, and, and I was the same myself, having a love of teaching and of the students and seeing the students develop, I didn't see myself in management at all. And I hear so many managers say, I don't really like the admin side so much. My job, academic management, is not about 
the admin side, of course we must have the mechanical systems working, but it's so much more. It's about working with development, working with people on a daily basis. A teacher training is another opportunity as well, of course. Um, so there are, there are different pathways to go into with positions of responsibility. Now, what I would like you to do, those are some of my ideas. I'd like you just to think for a minute and take some of that in while I'm reading through the comments that are coming up here. Which of these do you feel that you might be able to use? And of course, you might need to adapt them. They're not going to work as they are for you, but there might be some little things that you can take away. So I want you just to keep that in your mind. Now, as you're thinking, oh, I can see Martina saying, job shadowing is a great idea, very useful. Well, Martina, you're welcome to come to Wimbledon. Cherry saying, reflection, online support. So, I'd like to move on to action research that I touched upon there. And um, action research, I know the English UK here in the UK, and I know English Australia, in Australia, obviously, uh, they both now run quite formalised action research projects where they provide funding for teachers and uh, their action research project is, is published. We run action research in the school that I work in, and I've done this in the past myself as well. And I find it a very useful way of focusing on my own development. So I'm going to break down for you the system that I would use with, with teachers that I'm working with. And again, if you just think, how might you adapt this to your own situation? So action research. Well, it starts by self-observation with a detailed lesson plan, giving you yourself a holistic view with new eyes of how you teach and how your learners receive that and learn from it. From self-observation, you identify one area or aspect of teaching to focus on from your first self-observation. And that can be something as simple as how do you do grammar correction at high levels? Or how do you do communicative activities at low levels? It can be something like that. So self-observe again with a focus on that specific area. What did you like? What could you do better? Again, get someone else involved. I'm saying self-observe because this is the most autonomous. This is something that we can do for ourselves without having to look at time and money and relying on other people. But it's very useful to get other people involved in this. Then you have some thinking time. Uh, and this, this is ha thinking about how to improve, how to develop. During this time, and you give yourself, or work with a partner or your line manager, to give yourself time line for this. So thinking time might be a week or two weeks, where you do research, you go online, you talk to other people, you talk to your colleagues and work, you observe peers uh, focusing on this area. Talk to your academic manager. You're gathering lots of thoughts. This is a time for you. It's a kind of mental brainstorming here. And then from there, you try these out and experiment with the new ideas. What's working for you? What's not working for you? Things that maybe surprised you as well. Analyze it again. Give yourself some more time. Keep a record. Um, Note down all of the things that you, as I said, that surprised you from, from what you're seeing about your, your own new way of teaching. Make a deduction. Make a deduction. What kind of conclusion are you coming to? And then incorporate this new, new developed style into your everyday teaching. Taking it forward which not everyone will do, but taking it forward, this can also lead you into more in-depth research. And then I would suggest passing this knowledge, this research that you've done on in the form of a teaching seminar to your colleagues, possibly presenting at a teacher's conference or writing an article. This gives you a little bit of closure, a little bit of um, an end to the, the process where you feel that you've achieved something. 
And then finally from this, you can set yourself two teaching goals moving forward and maybe one professional development goal, something else that you want to work on from there that you've felt come up. And just to give you a little idea, something that we worked on with, with a teacher that uh, I worked with a few years ago, he was a, an expert in proficiency and post-proficiency classes. And what he wanted to look at was how he works on pronunciation at such a high level. He followed this action research project, and I worked very closely with him in order to keep him on track because it's so difficult. I think sometimes we've got all the best will in the world, but if someone else knows about it, then there's more chance, I think, that you'll stick to, to setting yourself these goals and these timelines. So he, he followed an action research project looking at his pronunciation lessons for very, very high levels. He came to, to some conclusions, which he then ended up taking to IATEFL. And that was a new professional development goal for him in itself. He'd never been to IATEFL, the conference. He'd never presented at conference before. And it, it allowed him to springboard into many, many different areas from there. And so that was a very good, a very good example, I felt, of action reflex. Uh, re so just for you to think about, as I said, take these away. They might not all work for you, um, but which of them appeal to you? How might you approach them? How might you adapt them, share them with your colleagues, and implement them into your busy lives? Because it's not, it's not easy. And what I've now done is I've provided you with a, a long list of accessible CPD opportunities. But I would stress that less is more. Choose one or two of them that you feel would work for you. Try them out with your colleagues. I'm just looking at the comments now. Fatin has said, my dream is to present to IATEFL. Well, I, Fatin, I do hope that you achieve that. So moving on. So what have I, what have I looked at so far? I've, I've provided you with a definition of CPD. Um, I thought about why we develop. Looked at reflecting on how much you've achieved in a year, in your life, in your professional life, and the importance of reflection and recognizing our achievements. In order to set goals, thinking about what's available and accessible to us, and providing you with a, a detailed action research model. So this is all very well, but how do we structure this now? I'm saying you don't want to do too much too soon. So how do we structure it? And I would suggest a framework. And what I have here is um, an example of the British Council CPD framework that was designed a few years ago. The website's there. And it's a handbook for managers. It's a handbook for teachers. It's a framework for continuing professional development, and it's a portal with advice, suggestions, video clips. And just to give you an idea of what part of it looks like, this is the framework here. And it divides us as teachers into five levels. And it's for us ourselves to identify or to work with someone, to identify what level we are. And this is the opening of the handbook. And then it goes into more detail about areas of CPD at each level, what you can work on, what your priorities could be. Now, I must say at this point, this is only one example of a framework. There are many frameworks out there. Um, I know there's also the equals framework. And I would also say that frameworks, and especially this one, it's not, it's not linear. CPD is not a linear process. You can't go. It's too simplistic to think you can go from level one to level two, to level three. You will be in different levels for different parts of your teaching, your teaching career. However, this is one way of trying to channel and allow us as teachers to, to structure and focus and identify the pathway that we, we want to go on within ELT, rather than things just falling at our, at our feet, I guess. Now, in the CPD handbook, someone is asking how I find this. Ah, I've just seen Cherry Imp has just put it up. Uh, but there it is again. There's the link, British Council English Agenda. 
and you can download the handbook for managers and the handbook for teachers. And whether you're a manager or a teacher, I recommend you download both. So what you would do with this in order to give yourself structure, let's imagine that you consider yourself to be a developing teacher. Um, and you're still building your confidence and your skills, you're thinking about further qualifications. You would go in the British Council handbook um, to this level and you would find hints on how to progress, what's open for you at that level. It would also allow you to identify positive signs at this level of where you are in your career. And also maybe alarm bells if you're becoming uh, possibly a bit settled at one level, how do you give yourself that push forward? So it's a very, very useful tool. I'll just show you, this is the manager's portal and then there's, there's a similar one for teachers as well and on this you do have clips uh, talking about CPD, talking about observation, etc, etc. So I recommend that you do have a look at that download it, share it with, or as I said, any others. I mean, in your countries as well, you may have different frameworks or different structures to help you identify the pathway that you want to follow and what's open to you for CPD. Now, I'd just like to round up, finally, by giving you a few hints. Some of these I've already covered, but a few hints on how to access and implement CPD into our work. So, as I said before, get online, and here I am, um, talking to 45 people who are online, so wonderful, once again. There's a lot of variety in things available, so be selective. What are you interested in? What will be useful for your clients? What will move yourself forward? Be selective. If you take on too much, you'll end up not doing anything. No, I'm speaking <laughs> about myself there. Um, Build into what you already do. Don't give yourself extra work unnecessarily. Give it a structure. Don't see it as a separate thing. Build into what you do. Set yourself a goal and tell people, this for me is the key. If I keep my goals to myself, then I change the goalposts sometimes. But if you tell other people, I find that you're more obliged to stick to them. Less is more, as I said. You know, don't, don't leave this, this webinar this afternoon and think, oh, I'm going to do five of these things. No, try two, try one. Provide time for reflection and recognize your achievements. Work with someone, if you can at all, either virtually or face-to-face. -face. Lead by example, but also lead by your own example. And that goes back to reflecting and giving yourself a pat on the back for what you already have achieved. See the bigger picture. Know why you're doing something. It's not only for your immediate satisfaction and for the immediate gain of your students. It's for, as I mentioned at the beginning, it's for our profession. It's for ourselves. We want to, we want to reach 70, 80 years old and look back and think, that was a success. Didn't I do well? Choose activities that are interesting for you and suit your own learning style. There's definitely a mirror here with teaching and learning and what we do with students. We need to know, not only in a needs analysis with students, we need to know what they need from their English course. We need to know what they don't need. But we also need to know what they like, what they're interested in, what they're not interested in. And that's the same for ourselves. Ask your peers for feedback and tell them what you're doing. Again, if they know this, this is contagious, that your peers will then get enthusiastic. And practice self-promoting. Be aware of your achievements and tell people. Um, and I know this isn't always comfortable, but again, I do believe as teachers, we hide away in our shells. And um, share these. People feel good for you generally um, when they see you progressing and being enthusiastic and passing this on. And then, of course, the downside is the consequences of avoiding CPD. And I'm not going to go into these because I think we all know what these could be. But I think Penny Ur a few years ago, 
um, made a comment on what's the difference between five years experience and a year's experience repeated five times. And I think that's something that we always must keep in our head. Are we still doing the same thing again and again? Is this year the same as last? And if so, do something about it next year. And finally, I've gone through quite a few areas, aspects, tools possibly. A lot of these we can transfer to the classroom as well. So I've talked about us as professionals, us as teachers, and how we can access CPD. But a lot of these things we can take into the classroom, and I just want to share these a couple of minutes with you. Um, goal setting, individual learning outcomes, crucial for students. Tie them into tutorials, meetings that you have with them. Make them smarter for students. A reflection, if you do tutorials with your student, then give them tasks to reflect upon beforehand. Have review slots in your classes. Do learning reflection journals with them. Collect them in. System thinking, the, the map that I showed you uh, in the middle of my webinar there. This is great for business students. It brings out lots of adjectives, lots of really rich vocabulary. The thing that I would say with system thinking is if you're going to ask students, um, then keep it lighthearted because it is, as I said, quite a powerful tool to focus on their lives and then the important components of their lives can be a very personal thing. So um, go, go into that cautiously with students. But as I said, it works a treat with professionals, business people. And then action research as well, project, casework, all of these. You can transfer to one-to-one -to -one students, long-term students, for example. Give them structure, give them motivation. So hopefully what we're doing is we as teachers are leading our students by example as well and sharing our experiences with our students. I've come to the end. Um, this is my email. If, if anyone would like to continue, because 50 minutes is quite a short amount of time to cover some of the things that I've covered. If anyone would like to, to email me, I'm more than happy to elaborate in any of these areas. But I'd just like to take the next few minutes now to, to have a look and see what questions are coming through and see if there's anything that I can answer. If anyone does have any questions now, please do just type them in and I'll see what I can do. Okay, I've just seen a whole list of questions here that I'd like to try and explain now. Um, so, oh, <laughs> Wisam asks, what was my greatest achievement in 2014? Uh, I do feel that I've had many, but to be honest, I, I had a wonderful experience going to Georgia this year and doing some trainer training there, and that was, that was a great experience with managers. That was a really good achievement for me. Um, Pete, so how does job shadowing work? Pete from Germany and also Gloria uh, from Argentina is asking about job shadowing and Cherry. To be honest, job shadowing for me is quite new and I'm curious to see how the week with my, my um, job shadower is going to be next year. But in, in a, a small term basis with teachers, that can be about sharing lesson planning and then sharing observation. And to give you an, an example, what two of my colleagues have done in terms of job shadowing is they have planned their lessons together for the same level. They've shared their experiences of why they're doing things differently based on their style of teaching compared to their colleagues. And then they've observed each other, they've taught each other's classes, they've got feedback from the classes and from each other. And in that way, they've, they've observed how they've done their job over a week. So as a teacher, it's been, it, it was quite interesting for them, but it tied in peer observation, lesson planning, and a lot of discussion on different styles and different student needs and, and learning styles themselves and how to match them. As a manager, I would say it's, it's slightly different because a manager would be in my office talking about the different systems that we use, 
uh, the recognising different people's styles and in our staff, etc. Um, job shadowing again. Uh, is it okay if I share a few of your slides on my blog? Yes, of course, Pellin, please do. More than welcome. Um, Fatin, no, I do not mind at all if you publish my slides. More than happy for that, Fatin, as well. Difference between continuous and continuing? No, I don't think so, to be honest. I, I use the two interchangeably. I could be wrong here, but um, I, I also see the P sometimes as being professional and sometimes as personal. And again, I would say they're inter interchangeable for me as well. I think that's all of our questions. Uh, I am going to say to everyone now, thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you all online with me. If you do have any further questions, then as I said, I'm happy to answer anything on email. And I do believe our webinar is being recorded. So if you want to go over anything again, or if colleagues want to log in, then I'm sure they can. So thank you very much. It's been a pleasure talking to you. And um, I hope to see you again online or at IATFO possibly. <laughs> Thank you. Clap, clap, clap. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>